In his short but influential work, German Jews Beyond Judaism, which has come up numerous times already, George Mossy paints a very particular picture of the cultural emancipation of German Jews and their efforts to integrate into German society. With an eye firmly fixed on the rise of Nazism and the Holocaust, Mossy uses the first chapter to chart out the development of a new Jewish identity that arose as a response to emancipation and assimilation. And relying on the writings of what he describes as an articulate minority, Mossy suggests that German Jews sought to, quote, transcend the gulf between their own history and the German tradition, end quote. And with this liberal outlook, they aimed at self-cultivation. Their search for a new personal identity went, as he stresses, beyond religion and nationality, and was instead centered on Bildung. Now, we've already discussed here on numerous occasions that this is on one hand that we should take this as a confession of his own personal faith, and certainly a critique also of the opportunities and options of Jewish identity as they were played out in the United States, and in some cases still are. But I think we should also point out that this is but one side of a double blind spot that I'm going to be discussing too, and also a little bit of an ironic, because his own family was involved in religious life um, including his father's engagement with the reform community in Berlin. Most importantly, jo Mossi's German Jews were secular male intellectuals who were, quote, aware of their Jewish origins, emphasis, um, but in their own present time activities appear to have made little space for Jewishness or certainly for Judaism. And instead, they transcended Judaism they, and simultaneously rejecting conversion to Christianity. The spokesmen of the community voiced their dedication to humanity and cosmopolitan humanism and liberal values. While Mossi's central contention in the opening chapter of his book rests on the assertion that Jewish identity was based on a noble illusion, his words, and as a consequence that Jewish integration into German society was ultimately chimerical, his thesis gives voice to what are now very common historiographical assertions about the secular nature of German Jewish identity. Namely, and repeatedly we see, that modern German Jews were beyond religion. The image of German Jewish identity as being anchored in a building that espoused secularism and enlightenment values has inf influenced the field profoundly. Though scholars have since sought to revise Mossi's thesis, the overall image of German Jews beyond Judaism has been actually quite hard to shake. For instance, J. Howard Geller's recent book on the Scholem brothers returns to this notion, and he presents the options of Jewish self-identification in very secular, i.e., a religious, political, and cultural terms. Geller argues that religious practice had, quote, ceased to be a primary marker of Jewishness for most German Jews, end quote, even as they nevertheless affiliated socially, culturally, and professionally to Jewish organizations. Cultural identity, um, Geller asserts, stood in for religious one. To be sure, the cultural identity that Gellers and others have uh, depicted is no longer merely just a simple building as a uniform cultural code, but in this revised historical understanding come in a variety of autonomous, internally driven moments. They remain, however, a religious formulations. Now, Mossi's working definition of secularization, along with that of many scholars since, links the term firmly to a decline of religious practice and belief. And on this point, it would actually seem a little bit hard to disagree with them. If we consider halakhically based religious observance, so observance based on Jewish law, we must concede that religious practices of the majority of German Jews were distinctly, had distinctly changed, and that most German Jews abandoned at least a thoroughgoing dedication to the halakha, again, Jewish law. According to Adam Ferziger, in the first decade of the 20th century, most German Jews, a very impressive 80%, did not observe Shabbat. Yet, as Robin Judd has, remind, has reminded us, Jews continue to practice other rituals, especially circumcision. And as Marion Kaplan has noted for some time, the family rem home remained an important site of ritual and practice during the imperial era. In the sense that we do not have to see secularization as an act of replacement or, quote, an inevitable or deliberate loss of an autonomous religious culture, end quote. Rather, as Andreas Gotsman has suggested, secularization can and perhaps should be understood as, quote, an increasingly ambivalent interactive process in which German Jews' culture's, culture's own heritage was redefined, end quote. Critically, this was a process that was both private and was based on personal choice. After all, despite this privatization and individualization of religious belief and practice, religion in general, and Judaism in particular, remain important for a broad swath of population. 
albeit in new and very different ways. And so the challenge of scholars of German Jews has thus been to understand the numerous changing forms of Judaism and, not, and to take them seriously as modern expressions of an evolving religion. And this search has propelled scholars to consider the family home as a site for the transmi transmission of Jewish values. Yet if we turn to the domestic sphere in order to uncover familiar religiosity, we, we fall or we can confront wider disciplinary and epistemological consequences. In their introduction to the recent volume, Deborah Dash Moore and Marion Kaplan suggest that the dearth of studies on women in modern Jewish history more broadly is a result of the propensity in the field to favor intellectual and political history. This tendency, they argue, gives primacy to a male public story, like the one told by Mossy, which ignores unconscious Jewish identity as well as vital feelings and actions, particularly in the private sphere. And to their credit, they are also not just looking at women in the private sphere, they are trying to look and reveal at men's activities in the private sphere. And we also have to add that beyond these examinations of the private sphere, there, is a num there are a number of scholars who have chosen to focus on the developments of Jewish religious movements in Germany, along with studies of their leading rabbinic minds and the controversies which they fought. But these are largely male-oriented studies. And so we are left still with impressions of an increasingly secularized community that have very few present tense connections to Judaism, perhaps except in the home, or on the other hand, a small cadre of male religious leaders. And what I want to do in the remaining time that I have today with you is that I want to present a different story. One of German Jewish women in the early 20th century who not only participated in Jewish religious life, but actively sought to shake it and to sought to shake it on a public um, sphere and in the public realm. Jewish women in general and German Jewish women in particular were heavily involved in creating religious culture. They engaged in public debates on rituals, religious values, and education, as well as the very place of women in Judaism. They wrote historical and educational texts seeking to provide a set of old and new heroes for Jewish girls and women. They translated religious texts, especially Sidurim, so prayer books, into the modern vernacular, and they penned their own. And they took on new public leadership roles. Seen collectively, their work did not always or necessarily challenge traditional gender roles. In fact, and I'll show some examples shortly, they sometimes confirmed them, though at times to different ends. But their participation of Jewish women in creating religious culture was a significant phenomenon during the early 20th century and especially during the interwar years. And these activities did span denominational lines. At the heart of a number of the discussions that would emerge in the period and that continue today stood the issue of the nature and extent of women's participation within the synagogue. These debates occurred in the backdrop of the broader struggles and notable successes of, German, of the German women's movement, including gaining the right to vote in 1919. In religious circles, both Jewish and Christian, individuals deliberated over the extent to which women could or should enjoy what was deemed and described at the time as complete equality within houses of worship. They asked, could women preach and could they serve as religious leaders? In the liberal Jewish world, leading voices in the community debated the very controversial question, could a woman serve as a rabbi? For a number of historians, the answer to this question has revolved neatly and perhaps at times too centrally around the figure of Regina Jonas, who in 1935 became the first woman to receive rabbinic ordination. Jonas's story is often presented in isolation, and here is another important historical blind spot. Even her biographers tend to give the impression that she was entirely unique and that there was nothing that came before her. Alisa Klapek, again one of said um, biographers, for instance, suggests that in the 1920s, few would have imagined that one day a woman would become a rabbi, even among ideologically committed liberals. This statement is a bit misleading. A number of individuals in the 1920s not only imagined the possibility, but debated it, laying the ideological groundwork for Regina Jonas and ultimately others to seek rabbinic ordination. The broader discussion on the roles of women, uh, on the roles women could play in public Jewish life remind us that as much as uh, Jonas's 1935 ordination was groundbreaking and her own story indeed unique, she was not alone in her quest to realize her calling. 
So let us consider two important milestones that took place in the 1920s, one rhetorical theoretical and another very practical. First, on the rhetorical theoretical level, in November 1926, the Berlin-based Jüdisch Liberale Zeitung published a series of responses by lay and religious leaders on the time, at the time, on the theme, Die Frau im Gotteshaus, so the woman in the house of God. The responses highlighted points of consensus and disagreement within liberal Judaism about the various roles women could play within the synagogue, touching on themes such as mixed gender seating, whether women could sing solos or in choirs in the synagogue, their participation on communal boards, and the possibility of women serving as preachers and or rabbis. The first to respond was Rabbi Dr. Hermann Vogelstein, a prominent liberal rabbi who served in Breslau at the time. He proclaimed with great pride and certainty that, quote, the question of the participation of the Jewish woman in religious services has long been since practically re resolved, end quote. Citing the existence of women's choirs and the fact that women were allowed to sing solos, overturning a halakhic prescription against hearing a woman uh, sing alone, as well as the lack of mechitzot, or barriers between a women's and a men's section in numerous liberal synagogues, Rabbi Vogelstein stressed that women were now visible and audible participants in prayer services. He further stressed how the liberal movement now placed great importance on educating Jewish girls and on encouraging their participation in confirmation ceremonies. Yet lest the reader be mistaken, Rabbi Vogelstein was no advocate at what was defined at the time as full gender, gender equality. For him, Judaism was the religion of the home, not just the synagogue, and the main role of women was to be played out in the home. In his short response, he essentially drew a line in the sand by outright ignoring the more provocative question addressed in many of the following responses, namely whether a woman could be a rabbi. Indeed, of the 10 total responses printed in the Jüdisch Liberale Zeitung, six raised the topic of female rabbis and female preachers, with four writing in favor of women's rights to serve as rabbis. It is important to note that even among respondents who suggested that women would only gain full equality within the community by becoming rabbis, the justifications for these same commentators made frequently followed a very traditionally gendered logic. Elsa Dormitzer, children's book author and the first woman to serve on the executive committee of the Zentralverein, began by highlighting the recent advances made by women in the political realm of various local Gemeinden. She lauded the introduction of family seating, suggesting that it ensured better manners in the synagogue. These changes, however, were not enough for her, however, and she questioned whether the time had not come for women to read from the Torah, and even more importantly, whether it had not come time for women to serve as rabbis. Answering her own rhetorical questions, Dormitzer maintained that women could serve these roles and argued again that all, full equality would only come when women were able to become rabbis. Dormitzer argued that, in fact, women were ideally suited to the task. Women's, quote, gentle and personable nature made them excellent at comforting those in mourning and supporting the fallen. It's fascinating how she employs religious rhetoric in the sense that we often associate with God. There were, as she told the readers, educated Jewish women who could read Hebrew and who were learned in Talmud and in Torah, and in short, there was nothing stopping women from taking on the various tasks associated with the rabbinical calling, Dormitzer suggested. She even declared that there was nothing innovative about women becoming rabbis, and she highlighted several examples from the Middle Ages of women who had played the role of preachers. A female rabbi, Dormitzer intoned, would be, quote, nothing new under the sun, end quote. A further commentator, Hedwig Ritz, concurred with the idea that women could play the role of Rabbinerin and echoed several contentions Dormitzer raised. In contrast to Rabbi Vogelstein, who tried to urge women to return to the family home to find their calling, Ritz upends that argument and actually suggests that precisely because women had come to say, play such important pedagogic and spiritual roles in the family home, such as showing their children the way to Judaism, in her wording, they had proven their capacity and importance as Jewish educators. Reitz added that women were also naturally gifted in precisely the tasks that were so critical to the contemporary rabbi. So why shouldn't an educated, qualified, capable woman be called to the Torah, she asked, and what stopped a woman from preaching? 
Given women's talents at this giving spiritual counsel, again, an argument we hear in uh, Dormitzer and by another woman who also supports female rabbis in the series, were women not ideally suited for the pastoral roles that were, in her opinion, so lacking in most congregations? Now, of course, not all agreed with these commentators and not all wrote directly on the question of whether women could uh, serve as rabbis. Furthermore, the debate was not near neatly split with women on the one hand supporting the innovation of ordaining female rabbis and men on the others opposing it. Mina Schwartz, philanthropist and founder of a women's chapter of the B'nai Brit Lodge in Berlin, firmly and in very gendered language argued against female ordination or for that matter being called to the Torah. Emil Blumenau, the chairman of the Jewish community of Cologne, wrote that he did not think that most people, men and women, wanted a female rabbi. Yes, he admitted that this was a lot more of a feeling that he had, and it was not based on the study of religious rulings, something that Regina Jonas would actually do. She would uh, write a long text explaining and studying why a woman could become a rabbi. While the debate in the pages of the Jüdisch Liberale Zeitung were essentially hypothetical at the time, practical advances were already in the making. Only one and a half months prior to the printing of the aforementioned 10 responses, Lily Montague gave a sermon entitled Man's Answer to God's Call on Yom Kippur in, Ber in London's liberal synagogue. Two short years later, on August 19, 1928, she would preach again, but this time in German, in the Reform Synagogue on Johannesstrasse in Berlin. This is the Mossi Synagogue, uh, or the, family, the synagogue that the Mossi family is involved in. With her sermon on personal religion, she became the first woman to take to the pulpit in a synagogue in Germany. Regina Jonas's ordination in late December 1935 thus followed a public debate over the place of women in the synagogue and the pioneering actions of other women, like Lily Montague, who pushed the boundaries of what had been considered acceptable roles for women in the public sphere. We can also add to this the numerous female students of the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums, including Ellen Littmann, who would later teach Bible at the Leo Beck College in the United Kingdom. German Jews, we must remember, were thus in many ways far from being removed from Judaism. Religious belief and practice were not simply relics from a bygone traditional era that German women preserved in the home as their menfolk modernized. Instead, a notable number of German Jews, including and perhaps especially German Jewish women, actively reassessed and reconfigured Judaisms in the early 20th century. And they did so at home, in associations, on communal boards, and in print, and in the synagogue. Thank you.